So uh, welcome everybody as you're coming into the room. We've got participants entering now and we've got Rosemary Dewar here from Castle, well, not from Castle Comer, from home, actually from studio at home, um, who's going to do the very first Mastercraft talk. So as people just file into the room, we'll, uh, I'll just turn on my camera there. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. So pot's ready. Here we go, Clay. So 24. So uh, I'll just get going on a quick introduction. So uh, Design and Crafts Council has uh, launched a series of webinars for the past uh, five weeks or so now. And they've been getting re really, really large numbers of people watching. And as we were kicking around ideas of how we could improve these, one of the ideas that came out was the idea that maybe makers might have stories or things or learnings they might want to share with other makers. And so that's where the Mastercraft talks came from. So we launched a call out for them and uh, the first series of Mastercraft talks are starting today. We are very, very keen to get more ideas and more proposals in from people. So if there's anyone watching who would like to take part in Mastercraft talks, please get in touch with us and just put a question in on the, on the, on the table here or on the chat or send an email. Um, Rosemary Dorr is a highly uh, celebrated potter from Kilkenny, uh, a very important member of Made in Kilkenny uh, Guild. And um, she is um, you know, making really exceptional uh, tableware and homewares. And uh, Rosemary proposed um, to come up with a Mastercraft talk on making larger vessels. And so we're delighted to have her today show us how this can get done. And uh, without further ado, I'll disappear and let you get on with it, Rosemary. Thanks very much again for doing it for us. Thanks, Brian, for that introduction. Um, well, I'm coming from the studio here in Castle Comer, just outside Castle Comer, um, my home studio, where I've been working since the lockdown happened. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a space I can share with my husband, Andrew Ludic, and it's nice to be able to work from home. So today, I'm going to show you really just how I make pots, more or less. Um, I would have learned different techniques back after graduating over 25 years ago from the Pottery Skills course in Thomastown, and I would have worked in Kiltray Bridge Pottery in Wexford, where they make bigger pots, um, a lot of flower pots, um, and they just, a lot of big guys, wonderful throwers down there, who use different parts of their hands, which a lot of people do, not just their fingertips. It gives them more control when making bigger pieces. Um, so I use this in both tableware and making larger pots. I see a lot of videos online of people using their fingertips when making pots. And it just seems for me that they get a lot more control over the clay if they used different parts of their fingers so an important part of it as well is being well anchored and very solid in how you're sitting so that you're in complete control of the clay and when opening up on bigger shape instead of using fingertips use the sides of your hands like that And using this part of your knuckle and finger, going, lifting the clay up, it just means you can make pots as efficiently as possible. So usually pots would take me about, for smaller wear, two, two pulls of clay and for a bigger piece like this, which is two kgs, I usually aim to make it in three pulls and then just a final shape. So that's pull two.
And then the final shaping just with the kidney. So with most of my wear, I don't actually turn the pots at all. With these bigger pieces, this has a footprint. So I will tomorrow put this back on the wheel and trim the base and turn a foot ring into it. But most of the pots, all of the clay that goes into the pot is left in the pot. So as I said, this is 2 kg. And then I'm going to show you down to one of my smaller pots, which is the cup. And these are 250 grams. So just to see how I can use my fingers effectively for pulling up the clay in smaller wear. I'm not sure if Brian said it there, but if you have any questions, just type them in as we go and I'll answer them when I'm finished. So here I'm just using this part of my finger again. And, and with a cup like this, it's just a simple straight cup. So two folds. And then I just refine the shape with the kidney. I also, I use a mirror, that's what I'm looking in here. It really helps with seeing the shapes. And then I'll just show you a smaller version of that larger bowl I did. Those larger straight bowls come Come in three different sizes, so this would be a smaller version of a big one. This is 750 grams of clay. I also use a sponge when throwing, and it just helps keep the clay moist so you're not over and back to the water all the time, and it gives a nice fluidness to your pulls. So again, using this part of my finger, I know I have, a, I have a extreme potter's nod and it can be very distracting, so, but I can't help that. When I put up videos on YouTube or on Instagram, I always do close-ups so you can't see that my head nodding away. And, and now you know why. Sometimes on, on these bowls, I also do a little scalloped edge detail on, on the rim. Um. I 
I just want to make one more cup, uh, a round shape cup that I make as well, so you can get an idea of different shapes. So with smaller wear, I would, I, I do use my fingers to open up, but um, and again, using this part of my finger. And I use a profile just to finish off this shape and that. Again, it cuts out any turning on these shapes. They're just trimmed and stamped. I don't even wire them off because they pop off these bit wooden bats when they dry. Now, are there any questions there, Mary? That yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in here um, and there's a couple about um, the bats that you're using. Do you always throw on the bats? Um, it depends on what I'm making. You know, the last few years I do for some reason. I used to, I used to take off all my tableware with my hands, but I think I, I do a range called the stacking range and it has to be really uniform um, and the pots all stack into each other in a straight line. And I got used to throwing those on bats so that I didn't distort them. So now I just tend to, to do the rest of my wear on bats too. It's more of a habit I got into. I didn't always do that. Okay, and then Holly's asking, what material are your bats made from? Because they're stuck so easily. They're wood. I don't know. I think it's marine pie. I inherited these from a potter, a pottery I used to work in in, in the Castle Yard in Kilkenny. Um, and they, they were all pre-made there, but I'm, it's marine ply, some kind of marine ply. I also use a slate bats, um, which I would have made myself, and that's just from slates cut into the long rectangular slates cut into four, and they, they kind of dull themselves. They can be a bit sharp at first, but yeah, so that, that's that. Okay, and then Barbara um, is saying, I notice Rosemary doesn't look at the form as she's pulling it up. I'd be interested in her talking to that. Does she find it easier to feel rather than observe it? Oh, um, you're probably observing more than I am. I don't think about it. I have a mirror, which is probably out of, out of view here, but I have this mirror right in front of me. So instead of looking at the, the pot, I look in the mirror at the reflection. And it's a technique a lot of people use. It helps a lot. It helps you from bending all the time. I mean, if you're if you're making pots every day for 30, 40 years, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting to it. Um, it's quite a physical thing, and you have to come up with techniques that minimize wear and tear on your body. And one of them is a mirror. It can help a lot, and you can get a good reflection of the shape. So. To see the shape, I look in the mirror, and other than that, I'm, I'm not conscious, I'm not looking at it, so okay. that makes sense. Okay, and then Claire Jones is asking, she's a total beginner, and she's saying, can you explain the hand position of outside versus inside when pulling up? Um, they're really pretty much opposite each other, so I, uh, what I explain for, in, in, especially for beginners, you see people sometimes throwing and their arms are, you know, connected to nothing and their hands are here and, and that just gives no stability. So it's important to have yourself at a good right angle and to be grounded that your elbows are either on your resting on your legs or tucked in to your torso. And that way you're a solid what would you say? You know, you're, you're solid in yourself. So your fingers are steady and solid. And 
I'm smaller where to have some connection between the both hands. Let me just say. I do it so much I don't even think about it. So when people ask me questions, I have to see how do I do it. Um, but the trick is just to have everything grounded and solid so that you can control the clay. Because if you're not grounded and solid, the clay will control you, as in go wobbly. So when I'm going, to, I'm going to make my first pull here, and these two hands are connected, and my inside fingers are directly opposite what you see on the outside. So that's the positioning. And I'm pretty much locked into that position. There is no giving it. So that way the clay is being forced up in a very steady, fluid motion. Does that make sense to you? Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Rosemary. And um, also, Neil Fennell is asking a question here. Um, is it possible to create own pots and bowls and organize the common use of a kiln? Um, I'd love to be part of a bulk firing. I think lots of people would be interested during lockdown. I'm not sure if that's possible during lockdown, but anyway. <laughs> um, I know of groups who get together to do wood firings because a wood firing is quite a long process. It can go on over a couple of days where groups of potters get together and they fill a kiln maybe two, three times a year and fire it. Um, other than that, um, you know, it depends on if there's a potter in your area. I know for me, I, I don't tend to share my kiln that much because unless it's somebody who's an actual potter who makes good pots, you can get explosions and things. And I'm not, I'm not willing to risk explosions in my kiln by other people's work, if that makes sense to, to lose a kiln because of that. But you've more chance in a, in a, in a school or college or, but not at this time. I can imagine people, it's not easy to get together to do stuff like that. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. The next question, um, Nikki is asking, is there a proportion between the thickness of the walls of a bowl and its size? For example, there are 300 gram mugs, one to two millimeters thick, as opposed to a big bowl, which is two kilogram thickness of side, which is five to seven millimeters. I'm not sure. You, consistency of thickness is what it's all about. I mean, once you go big with a bowl or a pot, you're not going to have it as fine of a cross section as you would on a cup because it would just be too delicate. So it, it just depends on some, I, I tend to throw quite finely. So the, my pots don't have a lot of excess clay in them and they are light to the touch. But I know other potters who make beautiful pots but they have, would have a, a thicker section in them. And it's not that they're made any, any worse or inferior. They're just, it's a different quality of pot and a different weight in it. People are drawn to what they like. So it's, it's really kind of personal choice. Once you don't have inconsistencies that you have thick bottoms and thin sides, or once it's a nice consistent thickness, I think that works for what you want to do. Okay, and then the next question, is the kidney you use made of wood or metal? I'm not sure if you've answered that already. Um, it, uh, no, it's plastic. Um, the ones I use most are ones I make myself, these. And they're made from the top of Hellman's mayonnaise buckets. So that from any cafe or catering place, you get those blue lids and the plastic in them is just perfect. I have this probably well, this 15 years anyway, at least. I mean, I reshape it every so often, but it's, it used to be quite big and it's wore down over the years. So I make a lot of my own tools out of, out of those lids. There's also, I would use this green one then as a mud tools and they do great tools as well. But probably like a lot of potters, I, I, I see tools, I buy them, but I still end up using the same couple of things that I've made myself um, most of the time. Okay. I never use 
Okay. The next question is just a follow up on the baths again. Um, you said you used slate baths. Do you mean actual yes. slate or like tiles that you've made yes. yourself? Yes, that, actual, that actual. would have picked up odd slate that work. The big rectangular ones, and you score them like as if you're um, cutting tiles um, with a scorer and just break them over a, an edge, and they, they break quite nice. Okay, that's fantastic. There's a lot of thank yous coming in here, Rosemary. I think that could be all the questions. Has anybody else any questions? Or Brian, did you want to say anything else? Yes, well, um, Rosemary, thanks a million for that. That was absolutely brilliant. And um, I sneakily stuck my, uh, my children to watch and uh, they were just amazed. How did she do that? Oh my God, we have to get a pottery wheel. You know, so it, it looks, I mean, you make it look effortless, really. Um, what I was amazed at was the speed at which you drew the larger pieces. And, and the accuracy that you're getting with that is, is amazing. Your touch, your very, your very light touch, actually. Uh, I can't imagine I'd even try it. But um, we were, uh, for everybody's benefit, we were wondering would would everything come off okay? And you did it amazingly, brilliantly. So thank you very much for that. No um, I hope everybody's questions were answered and asked and answered in, in the course of the uh, event. But if there are more, please come to us and we'll try and get Rosemary to answer them. And also just one last thing to please appeal to you. If you know someone who's got a great thing to show, uh, something they've achieved or something they've learned, it might be something to do with their craft business um, a new gallery they sold to, it might be a new packaging, it might be a technique, let us know. We'd love to get them online as well and grow the audience for this. So really appreciate it, everybody, for joining us. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Bye.